Oral questions, questions oral, l'honorable député de Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, this Prime Minister plays dangerous games when he describes anyone who doesn't agree with his dangerous policies as racist. Even some of his most loyal MPs have had enough of his half-baked ideas because they're having a harder time explaining them in their own writings. He calls us racist because we know just how bad Bill C-5 really is. If it passes, it'll reduce the number of incarcerations in federal penitentiaries by freeing dangerous offenders into our communities. I suppose he would also qualify Pierre Berrochet, the chief of police for Laval, as a racist, the honorable parliamentary secretary. Those who commit serious offenses will continue to receive serious sentences. Commit serious offenses will continue to receive serious sentences. Our bill is about getting rid of the failed policies of the Conservative government that have filled our prisons with low-risk, first-time offenders who needed help not to be put in jail. These failed policies did not deter crime, did not keep us safe. They target the vulnerable and racialized Canadians, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when the Prime Minister calls us racist because we oppose this dangerous bill, doesn't he realize that on the basis of the standard he's accusing members of his own caucus of the same thing? C5 is just a public relations exercise designed to reduce incarceration rates and freeing violent criminals who would otherwise be behind bars. Because he likes to brag about having the support of Canadians, is he aware that Stéphane Wall of the Community of Citizens in Action Against Gun Violence said that Bill C5 is in perfect dichotomy with the social context of gun violence? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Justice Speaker, let me repeat, those who commit serious offences will continue to receive serious sentences. Our government is committed to our criminal justice system reform. It's a promise that we made to Canadians and we intend to keep it. This is about criminal justice policy that actually keeps our community safe. A justice system that targets unfairly Indigenous peoples, black and marginalized communities is not effective, does not keep, our, keep us safe and must be changed, Madam Speaker. Good job. Madam Speaker, what does Bill C-5 do to protect our youth and discourage them from going down this path? It does nothing to discourage them. On the contrary, by abolishing certain mandatory minimum penalties, this is just reinforcing impunity for this type of act. And who said that? Annie Sampson. She's a former advisor, strategic advisor to municipal affairs and political analyst for Radio Canada. Is the Prime Minister claiming that the Chief of Police for Laval, the Community Citizens in Action Against Gun Violence, and now Ms. Annie Sanson are racists? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Um, un système de justice qui cible les people autochtones. If the justice system targets marginalized people, black people, and indigenous people, The situation needs to change. The testimony of the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, the Federation of Association of uh, Asian Canadian Lawyers, the South Asian Bar Association, as well as many legal experts have come forward and supported this bill, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. We've recently seen the Supreme Court interpret current law as allowing extreme intoxication as a valid defense against violent crimes. This is an urgent message that the legislation we pass here in this House must be absolutely clear. Yet this government is insisting on trying to weaken our justice system by allowing judges to sentence offenders to house arrest for violent crimes. So why is this government allowing drug traffickers and those guilty of firearms offences to go virtually unpunished. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I want to be very, very clear here, and I've repeated this before. Those who commit serious offences will continue to receive serious sentences. Our bill is about getting rid of the failed policies of the Conservative Party uh, policies that have filled our prisons with low-risk, first-time offenders who needed help not to be put on jail. These failed policies did not deter crime, did not keep us safe. They target the most vulnerable and racialized Canadians. Exactly. The Honourable Member for Calgary-Mindapur.
Well, this government can try to deny it all that they want. Organizations like Mad Canada and Women's Shelters know the truth. With Bill C-5, the court may order that the offender serve the sentence as house arrest for offenses such as sexual assault and harassment. This means many women will be stuck in their community with their offender. You know, the Prime Minister claims he's a feminist, but his legislation is causing harm to women. If he's really a feminist, why would he do that? The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary of the Ministry of Justice and the Attorney General. Madam Speaker, this is about criminal justice policy that actually keeps our community safe. I want to invite the member opposite to listen to the the very profound testimony of the president of the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, the Association of uh, Federation of Associations of Asian Canadian Lawyers, as well as the South Asian Bar Association. They speak to the, uh, the desperate impact of our cur current criminal justice system on racialized and Indigenous people, and I, I really reject the premise of the, of the question that posed by the opposite. L'honorable député de Saint Jean. Madame la Présidente, pendant Québec est en... Madam Speaker, while Quebec is in the throes of its debate on Bill 96, Ottawa is trying to get around one of its main measures with C-13. Ottawa is preventing Ottawa, or preventing Quebec rather, from applying the charter of the French language to businesses under federal jurisdiction. While we need to protect French in Quebec, Ottawa is protecting English at work. The Liberals are in a hurry. They just imposed time allocation on Bill C-13 to debate it as little as possible. Are they worried that the people of Quebec are going to mobilize against this bill that does not protect the right language in Quebec? The Minister of Official Languages. I want to thank my colleague. Our government is firmly committed to protecting and promoting French throughout the entire country, including Quebec. And we are firmly committed to supporting official language minority communities. That's why we have an ambitious bill that has more teeth to ensure that we can improve the situation of bilingualism in Canada. I hope that everyone will help us pass this bill. Thank you. When she talks about teeth, she forgot something important. Bill C-13 allows businesses to adhere voluntarily to the Charter of the French Language. And she knows full well the difference between voluntary and mandatory. If Bill C-13 passes, Bill 96 will apply only to businesses if they feel like it. It's difficult to believe that this hasn't been arranged in the back room when we know the position of many Liberals when it comes to protecting French. The reality is that in Quebec, French is what needs protection. Will the does the minister understand that it's anglicization of places of work that she's protecting with Bill C-13? The Honourable Minister. The position of Liberals on French is clear. It needs to be protected and promoted and cherished. It's a magnificent language that we're all going to defend. What I'm worried about is the radicalization of the bloc that says that Liberal members in Quebec are just Canadians. So you've got members for the Bloc Québécois and Canadians. There are Liberal MPs in Quebec who speak to Quebecers who are just as Québécois as them. The Honourable Member will need to adjust his microphone because we're hitting a lot of pops. It's too close to your mouth. The Honourable Member for Rosemont Leps Patrie on the ground. There is a great deal of anger. People are frustrated and worried, sometimes even in despair, because the federal government is unable to deal with their own files. There's horror stories, whether it be in immigration, for passports, for visas, for EI. The government seems unable to dr deal with things in a reasonable time frame, and it causes disastrous consequences for people's lives. When will the Liberals invest the necessary resources to respond quickly to the population's needs? The Honourable Minister. Madame la Présidente, et j'aimerais remercier mon collègue pour son... Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We understand Canadians' frustrations right now. We are responding to the unprecedented levels of requests we've received for passports. We're in a transition period. We're coming out of, or we hope coming out of, the pandemic. We're mobilizing the resources necessary to meet this level of demand, and we're hoping to keep those measures in place. Thank you. For Windsor West. 
Madam Speaker, the delay on the Huawei decision compromised our intelligence sharing with allies and compromised competitiveness of our domestic telecoms industry. Canadians deserve a real answer about why their national security and privacy was put at risk. It took three years to announce a ban and Huawei is still operating in Canada. The government wasted precious time and now they ask us to wait even longer for legislation that will finally protect Canadians and close this embarrassing chapter for our country. Why is this government failing to prioritize the national security and privacy of Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question and giving me the opportunity to come back to the announcement we did uh, yesterday. Madam Speaker, this has never been about a race. This is about national security. What we've announced yesterday is our intention in order to exclude equipment and services from Huawei and ZTE from the 5G telecommunication network in Canada, Madam Speaker. This is in the best interest of Canadians. This is protecting our national security, and this will ensure the resilience of our telecom sector for generations to come, Madam Speaker. Honourable off Official Opposition House Leader. Across Canada, residents depend on police, fire, and EMS services. These services, funded by tax dollars, are facing high gas and diesel prices to fuel their vehicles that are on the roads in every community 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The cost of fuel is, in many cases, blowing past emergency service budgets. Taxpayers in these communities can't afford additional increases in their property taxes to pay for these added costs. Why won't the Liberals scrap the carbon tax or lower the GST on fuel to not just help Canadian families who are suffering from high gas prices? but also for the emergency services as well. Great. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for the question. And, and Madam Speaker, Conservative politicians are making a lot of misleading claims about the price on uh, pollution. Uh, the facts are, and here are the facts, Madam Speaker, 70% of the gas price increase is due to crude oil prices going up, largely because of Russia's illegal war uh, in Ukraine. And another 25% of the price is the result of provincial taxes and refining margins. That's 95%, Madam Speaker. And as the Honourable Member will know eight out of ten families get more back in the climate incentive than they pay at the pump. The Honourable Member of South Shore, St. Margaret's. More misinformation from this government who refuses to deal with the issue of gas taxes. Volunteer fire stations in Nova Scotia are feeling the burn of your bad policies. The Chester Fire Department, in my riding, thanks to skyrocketing diesel costs, has doubled its fuel budget. Higher gas means reduced spending on training and vital equipment to keep our communities safe. The Liberals are forcing our volunteer fire services to pick between fueling their trucks and purchasing life-saving equipment. Will this government cut its excessive gas taxes to help our fire departments survive? Terry, oh, Madam Speaker, firstly, there's absolutely no guarantee um, that these companies will pass on any savings uh, to actual Canadian consumers if we do what the Conservatives propose. And secondly, on this side of the House, we do believe that climate change is real, Madam Speaker, and we know that we need to act now in order to ensure that we don't pay huge amounts in order to, to, to meet the climate uh, change catastrophe that is at our doorstep, Madam Speaker. For Essex. Madam Speaker, volunteer firefighters across Canada are called away from anniversaries, birthday parties, their job and family Christmas dinner to respond to emergencies and save people's lives. They do this proudly. We thank them for their sacrifice. Unfortunately, retention for these firefighters is very low for municipalities because the cost and burden is so high. Will the government respond to their emergency and give them gas re tax relief for municipal budgets? Well, Madam Speaker, I, I'm actually quite surprised that we're receiving any questions related to the economy after a week in which the Conservatives fired their finance critic and seem to have forgotten to hire a new one. And why did they fire him, Madam Speaker? Well, it's because he thought that it was a bad idea for the Conservatives to impugn the reputation and the independence of the Bank of Canada. Perhaps he also thought it was a bad idea to outsource our monetary policy to Bitcoin. Madam Speaker, if the Conservatives would like to see real economic policy that will put money back into the pockets of Canadians. They have only to open their copy of the budget. For Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Page six of the Liberal platform promised to develop a safe long-term care act to ensure that seniors are guaranteed the care that they deserve, no matter where they live. 
Madam Speaker, it's been seven and a half months. Where is it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I find it so ironic when Conservatives stand up in this House and pretend to support seniors. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Absolutely. since 2016, they have voted against nearly every single measure that our Shame. government has proposed for seniors. Shame. Just give you a few examples. GIS top-up benefit of $947 annually for the most vulnerable single seniors. The more majority, Madam Speaker, of which are women, voted against. Oh. Sorry, I order. It's very hard for individuals in the galleries and individuals who are listening uh, on uh, TV or on radio to hear what's going on when there's so much noise going on. Um, so I would ask members to hold on to their thoughts until it's their turn to ask a question. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary can end. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And if you want more, enhancing the CPP by 50 per cent for future retirees, Conservative Party voted against shame. it. Oh, cool. Shame. Madam Speaker, seniors know who's been there for them, and it is not the Conservative Party no of way. Canada. No. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Madam Speaker, clearly this member hasn't read page six of his platform. Oh, right. But I have. Oh, yeah. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that Canada has failed its seniors, especially those in our long-term care facilities. The conditions that many seniors find themselves in is deplorable. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, what steps is this government taking to address the appalling conditions in our long-term care facilities? Prime to the Minister of Seniors. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to highlight the challenges of long-term care, including gaps in infection prevention and staffing. I personally have seen these challenges and our government has made significant investments, including $4 billion to help provinces and territories improve the standard of care in those facilities, $41.9 billion in cash support to provinces and territories through the Canada Health Transfer. Madam Speaker, we will keep working with the provinces and territories so that we can fight COVID-19 together. Yeah, right, the Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, Mr. Way, speaker, or Madam Speaker, deficits, monetary expansion, and consumer taxes like the carbon tax all drive up inflation. And nowhere is this more obvious than in Canada's housing market, where the price of housing went through the roof at a time of massive job loss and shrinking GDP during mm -hmm. the pandemic. The government's response has been to pat itself on the back while a generation of Canadians give up on home ownership. When will this government get serious about reducing inflation, especially in housing? The Honourable uh, Minister. Madam Speaker, we know that uh, we need to increase housing supply in this country to give more Canadians the opportunity at, at home ownership. We also know that we need to help first-time home buyers with a tax-free savings account so that they can buy their first home. We also have banned foreign ownership of Canadian residential real estate to free up more homes for Canadian, uh, Canadian first-time home buyers. And in all those measures, and even more investments in affordable housing, they oppose those measures. So they can stand up here and talk about housing all they want, but when it comes to actually doing something about it, they have no ideas and they vote against it all the time. Madam Speaker, it's a World Bee Day today, but there's nothing to celebrate. Our bees are dying in Quebec. The rate of mortality is 60%. Imagine an average of 60% mortality. Bees play an essential role in pollination. Crop yields depend on it. On Wednesday, producers raise the alarm and they are requesting urgent assistance. No farm production can survive alone to such a catastrophe. Will the government help them quickly? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand the concerns of my colleague and I can assure him that we're working closely with industry. This is a particularly difficult year because of illnesses and climate change. That's why we're working with the Border Services Agency to find sources in order to increase our bee supply. We want to do this safely and we will work with them. Thank you. The member for Bertie Masquinonger. Madam Speaker, we also need to find long-term solutions to bee mortality. That's why I submitted a notice of motion to the Standing Committee of Agriculture and Agri-Food to find solutions. But now, right now, 
There are producers who are on the edge of despair and businesses that are on the edge of bankruptcy. It's urgent. They announced this Wednesday. The pollination of blueberries, cranberries, and other crops is being compromised by this catastrophe. We need to act and quickly. What will the minister do? The Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Once again, I want to reassure my colleague that we understand the importance of the situation. We're working short-term to try and get enough bees for the season, and we are also working in research and innovation, and we will find solutions for the short and long-term. Madam Speaker, the uh, whole world is starting to see the COVID-19 pandemic in the rearview mirror. Governments around the world are starting to ease up on gathering and traveling restrictions, and uh, Canadian travelers are certainly back in full force. Too bad their government isn't. Look at the long lineups at airports and passport offices. Madam Speaker, when will this government start following the science that the rest of the world is following and allow Canadians to get back to normal? The Honourable Minister. I believe it's me, Madam Speaker. Um, we know Canadians are tired, Madam Speaker, but ignoring COVID-19 will not make it go away. Um, the, uh, currently, we understand how frustrating uh, it is for Canadians to experience long lines and delays at airports. Uh, we can, uh, the Canadians can rest assured that we are working to resolve this issue as quickly as possible, and we have hired approximately 400 new screening officers that are currently in different phases uh, of their training across the country, and we continue to ask that Canadians remain patient as we work hard with CATSA and the air sector to find a solution. Yellowhead. Too bad that answer isn't actually helping Canadians. Madam Speaker, last week I questioned the Minister about Kristen from Hinton, who after waiting over two months ended up having to pay express service to get her three sons' passports. The Minister replied, if a person submits all required passport documents and Service Canada is outside its service standards, the client should not be paying extra fees. Madam Speaker, will the Minister confirm that Kristen and others who paid extra fees will receive a refund and no Canadian will pay extra fees due to this Minister's incompetence? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said last week, that is in fact correct, that no Canadian should be paying extra fees if, in fact, they have submitted all the correct documents and everything is in order with their application and in their application uh, is not processed within the processing times. Uh, so if, uh, in fact, that is the case, there is a refund process, and I'd be happy to follow up with the member opposite to share with him how he can share that with his constituents, but it's also available on the Government of Canada's website. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. While the world is getting back to normal, these Liberals are bent on keeping Canadians from returning to work. Their punitive mandates and virtue signaling are, in fact, imposing poverty upon some of its citizens. This includes at least four women in East Central Alberta who work for FCC and Canada Post. When will these Liberals allow these women and all the Canadians they fired to get back to work like before the pandemic? this pandemic, we made a commitment to Canadians to keep them health and safe during this pandemic. We have put in place measures to do so to protect workers and communities. And, Madam Speaker, federal public servants stepped up. They got vaccinated, fully vaccinated, up to 99 percent. And this shows that we know we need to continue to make sure that public servants and Canadians are safe. We are committed to review the current policy, and we will come back with a decision. In this place, we see the Liberals play COVID theatre with their masks, only to remove them as soon as they leave the parliamentary precinct at bars, restaurants and receptions. This as they insist on continuing never-ending mandates and restrictions. When will the Liberals stop their hypocritical theatre and end the mandate? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, it's very, very troubling to see members on the opposite side deny the existence of a pandemic that is still stealing the lives of so many of our neighbours. Just in the last three weeks, over 1,000 Canadians have died from COVID-19, and masks help. 
and vaccinations help. And time and time again, we're hearing from the Conservatives that they want to get back to normal. And I want this pandemic to be over too. Every Canadian wants this pandemic to be over. But just wishing it so does not make that happen. We must continue to be vigilant, wear our masks and encourage vaccination. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, uh, it's getting exceptionally loud in here, uh, and I'm having a hard time hearing the answer, and I'm sure that if the official opposition and the, uh, the government is uh, going back and forth, I'm sure they're not hearing the answer as well. So I would say that uh, members can please tone it down. The Honourable uh, Member for Courtney Alberney. Madam Speaker, people across the country are dying from the toxic drug supply. Instead of receiving help, they're being punished. A recent media report found that black and indigenous people continue to be disproportionately arrested on drug possession charges. This echoes what Health Canada's expert task force on substance use told the government over a year ago. The decriminalization will help Canadians get the help they need. The war on drugs doesn't reduce harm or help people. Will the government finally address the root causes of substance use by treating it truly as a health issue rather than a criminal issue? The Honourable Minister. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame la Présidente, and uh, I thank my colleague for uh, his question. Our government recognizes that problematic uh, substance use is a health issue, and we are uh, working to divert people who use drugs away from the criminal justice system and towards supportive and trusted relationship in health and social services. With the budget 2022 investment of an additional $100 million, we have now committed over $800 million to support community-led harm reduction treatment and prevention projects since 2015. I remember for Port Moody Coquitlam. Madam Speaker, last week all members in this house agreed to put in place without delay a Canada disability benefit. I thank the members for restoring hope to Canadians with disabilities. But hope is not enough. We must deliver action. It's been a year since the Liberals tabled a Canada disability benefit and let it fall. We cannot fail the disability community again. Will the government respect the will of this House and table the Canada disability benefit immediately? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Colleague for the excellent question. You know, since 2015, we have taken historic steps towards building a barrier-free Canada. In addition to the $112 million from Budget 2021, with Budget 22, you're, we are investing nearly $300 million in disability inclusion, including an employment strategy for persons with disabilities. Moving forward, we are absolutely committed to implementing the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, which will establish a robust employment strategy and enhance eligibility for government disability programs and benefits. And that includes, Madam Speaker, introducing the Canada Disability Benefit Act to address poverty among Canadians with disabilities. We all benefit when everyone. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, over the past two years, our tourism industry has been hit hard by the pandemic with public health orders and border closures. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance tell us how the government is supporting this industry, which remains a key economic driver and job creator, especially for young Canadians and rural communities? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from Sudbury for her question and for her hard work. I'm absolutely delighted to announce that we've just launched consultations to develop the renewed federal tourism growth strategy. We will be working with provincial, territorial and municipal governments and our Indigenous partners to develop this strategy to promote economic growth and stability. Together we will rebuild our industry and encourage people to visit Canada and enjoy our beautiful landscapes. Announced Ukrainians who come to Canada would be given temporary housing assistance and short-term income supports. Last week, Alexei, a Ukrainian, landed in Toronto and was greeted by the Red Cross. Unfortunately, there was no short-term housing or income supports because the program actually hasn't even launched yet. The announcement was made on April 9th. Today is May the 20th. Will the government keep its word and provide Ukrainians with the announced supports, or is this just another broken liberal promise? The, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, thank you very much. 
Speaker, and thanks to the member for his great advocacy. Uh, we both sit on the um, Committee uh, of Immigration, and I know how passionate and certainly involved he is. Uh, what the member is referring, Madam Speaker, and I have to say, uh, we have welcomed over 32,000 Ukrainian uh, in Canada, and certainly our commitment continues to be in helping uh, Ukraine as they come to Canada, and we will continue to support. And I have to say, Madam Speaker, that just last week, uh, we will be welcoming next week a charter flight here in Winnipeg. The Calgary Forest Lawn. So another broken promise, it looks like. Anna recently gave birth to their third daughter, Sophie, in a bomb shelter in Ukraine. Anna and her daughters had to leave their husband and father behind and escape to safety. They were forced to wait in Turkey because of impossible demands by IRCC, including demanding a birth certificate for Sophie, oh, wow. who was born in a bomb shelter. This is ridiculous. Will the Liberals finally accept that their policies aren't working at all and implement visa-free travel for Ukrainians? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, I must say, and again to the member opposite, um, individual case, I would certainly appreciate to have this conversation with him. Uh, as we always want to make sure, as the member well known, uh, there's numerous measures that we have put in place to ensure that individuals can come to Canada. And as I mention all the time, we will continue to be there to welcome as many people as Ukrainian as possible in Canada. Merci, Madam. For Edmonton West. Madam Speaker, Immigration Canada's annual fees report notes that just 19 percent of passports were processed within the required timelines. And this audit was well before the current surge and delays. Yet at the same time, 88 percent of executives at Immigration Canada received hefty performance bonuses. Does the minister believe failing Canadians applying for passports 81 percent of the time warrants performance bonuses? The Honourable Minister. As I said, we recognize that Canadians are experiencing frustration right now with the incredible surge in demand when it comes to passports. Uh, we are experiencing unprecedented demand, the likes of which we haven't seen since 2006, because over the past two years, Canadians followed public health advice, they stayed home, they did their part to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. We are working around the clock at Service Canada evenings, weekends, we've added over 100, uh, 600 sorry, additional staff at this point to ensure that we can meet those processing times in a timely manner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our member Edmonton West. This government was failing 81% of the times before the current surge. Now, the Service Fees Act requires government to develop service standards for government services that charge fees, such as for passports. It also requires the government to refund such fees if such standards are not met under the Director on Charge and Special Financial Authorities Act. The government has not been meeting their standards for passport application services, as we know, for well over 80 percent. Therefore, is the government refunding these Canadians as is required under law? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, uh, for in-person passport services, we're meeting standards about 98% of the time within 10 days. Uh, it's the mail-in option in which there are experiencing delays, and we continue to work around the clock. <laughs> Previous to the pandemic, the majority of passports were processed in person as opposed to the mail-in option. This has now shifted, and so we are um, adjusting and shifting resources as necessary, but we will continue to examine and do everything we can to make sure that we're delivering these services in a timely manner for Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The budget bill gets it wrong when it comes to the luxury tax. Instead of taxing billionaires who buy private jets, the government's taxing our aerospace industry and putting it at a competitive disadvantage to foreign competitors. Everyone in the industry agrees on that. The government is trying to push C-19 through as quickly as possible, but there's no indication they're trying anywhere near as hard to fix the problems with their luxury tax. Will the government commit to fixing C-19 so it stops undermining Quebec and its industrial flagship. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We know that the aerospace industry is of crucial importance to Quebec and, by that very fact, to all of Canada. 
those who are exporting jets uh, are entitled to a refund of that tax. This is a measure to ensure that everyone pays their fair par their fair part without any adverse consequences for our manufacturers. The Honourable Member for Joliet. That's not true at all. We've been working on this for months. There's been no communication. It takes six months to get a tax refund of hundreds of millions. Not often do management and the unions pull in the same direction, but that's what happened yesterday at the Finance Committee. The aerospace industry and workers came together with one voice and said, all it needs is a few fixes and the luxury tax will be fine. Otherwise, it misses the mark and does damage to our companies. The government may well have bought themselves a majority by cutting a deal with the NDP, but they're all alone on this one. Will they make changes to C-19? <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague again. I know he's working hard on our Finance Committee on this issue, and Madam Speaker, I can assure my colleague that we're working very closely with the industry, but we are taking steps to ensure everyone pays their fair share. And so the one percent of the wealthiest, we want to make sure they pay luxury taxes on luxury vehicles and jets. And that's a, an important commitment we've made. And I will work with my colleague to make sure that the manufacturers don't end up footing the bill. The carbon capture tax credit included in this year's budget was not included in the Budget Implementation Act. Wow. Why not? The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Madam uh, Speaker, I agree with the Honourable Member that uh, carbon capture and storage is going to be critical to reach our 2030 as well as our, our 2050 goals. So we need to use every tool in the toolbox, as our Minister of Environment and Natural Resources has said. Uh, the, this uh, incentive is, a, a, again, a critical tool to reduce our emissions, and uh, this is an important technology to share with the world, uh, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member Calgary Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Lots of tools in that box, I should say. But carbon capture is widely viewed by all scientific input as the nearest term solution to decarbonizing our energy needs. Mm -hmm. There is no path to environmental goals without it. Yeah. It's been over a year since the government rejected my tax credit on carbon capture because it needed to consult. After all that time, it was announced in this year's budget. Yet still, yeah. no action. So if the minister believes <coughs> the climate crisis is the biggest challenge the world faces, why is he so slow in advancing the most obvious solution? Here we are. The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I hope he's had a, a very deep dive on our emissions reduction plan, which is a very um, ambitious sector-by-sector uh, -sector pathway to reach our 2030 uh, emissions. And, Madam Speaker, carbon capture and uh, utilization and storage is going to play a very, very important role in that. But not only that, in the ERP, Madam Speaker, we've got incentives for infrastructure uh, and, and uh, and uh, support for electric vehicles, energy re retrofits for greener homes and buildings, and we're going to reduce oil and gas uh, emissions, and we're going to work with the sector, Madam Speaker. Dauphin, Swan River, Nippewa. Madam Speaker, a constituent named Sharon called me the other day. She said, I can't afford to drive to the city for groceries. Gas prices are crazy. Many agree with Sharon, especially rural and low-income Canadians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last week, the average gas price was 85 cents less per litre in the United States compared to Canada. Why? Because the, the Liberals love taxing fuel. Right Madam Speaker, why hasn't the government provided any tax relief for Canadians at the pumps? Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we know that a price on pollution is the best way to fight climate change and that inflation is a global phenomenon. We also know that the federal price on pollution is 11 cents per litre and that it is the only fee collected on gas that is refunded to consumers with eight out of 10 families actually getting more money back. Why is it that Conservatives oppose all of our affordability measures like childcare, retirement security and the national housing strategy, but are always willing to make life more affordable for very profitable oil and gas companies? The Honourable Member for King's Hands. 
Madam Speaker, friendship centers provide important culturally informed programs in employment, youth and housing for Indigenous peoples across the country. Friendship centers are important for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to come together and learn from one another. The Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre has been providing essential programs and services to Indigenous people from across Nova Scotia from its downtown location in Halifax since 1972. Madam Speaker, can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indigenous Service Canada inform the House on what this government is doing to support the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I do want to take this opportunity to thank the member from King's Hands for this very important question and his hard work on this file. The Mi'kmaq National Friendship Centre currently provides over 55 programs, including early childhood education, employment, housing supports for culture and language, as well as harm reduction. Yesterday, we announced $4.91 million in joint federal funding to contribute to the design, as well as the construction of this new facility. The funding will also support social and economic opportunities for Indigenous entrepreneurs. Building an improved, safe and accessible space that supports the delivery of high-quality culturally... Saskatoon Grasswood. Madam Speaker, Christie in my writing submitted her passport renewal by mail, which was the only option in March. She still, three months later, hasn't received her passport. When Christie actually heard from Passport Canada, she was given a phone number that spits out an automated message and then disconnects. When Christie wanted to file a complaint, guess what number Service Canada gave her? The same one! How embarrassing. When will the backlog be cleared? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There, are, there is a huge demand for passports at this point in time, and you know I understand the situation that Christie is in. I would invite the member opposite and any members opposite that if they also have urgent cases to please get in touch with my office. We are happy to help them to ensure that Canadians get their passports on time. As I've explained recently, uh, pre-pandemic, the majority of passport delivery issuance was happening in Service Canada offices. That has switched to mail-in. We are addressing this issue and allocating resources at, um, as necessary. Thank you, Madam. The Honourable Member for Lanark Front Neck Kingston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, two days ago, the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety stated, in response to the, in reference to the prison farm in Joyceville, to my knowledge, there is no slaughterhouse. End quote. Now, this would appear to contradict the response given on April 8th to another MP by the minister, by her minister, who stated that the existing slaughterhouse would remain in operation. So we're all a bit confused. Has the PS just announced that the slaughterhouse has been shut down and will not be reopened? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and I applaud the Honourable Member for his newfound interest in corrections, and I have to ask where he was when the Conservative government was making mean-spirited cuts to corrections, including prison farms. We know that the rehabilitation of those who committed crimes is important for public safety, and that's why we reopened the prison farms. It's good for public safety, it's good for inmates, and it's good for the community. I would ask him to ask the Save Our Prison Farms folks what they think about the prison farms in their community. There seems to be a lot of conversations going back and forth, uh, including from parliamentary secretaries, and so I would just ask members to ensure that they hold off to their thoughts while other people are trying to answer the questions. The Honourable Member for um, Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Madam Speaker, when the Canadian wine industry was targeted by Australia at the World Trade Organization, the Liberal government said they had the industry's back. Canada's 1,100-plus wineries and cideries need the level of government support that the European, Australian and American wine and cider industries receive, not the big Liberal tax grab in form of an excise duty. Will the finance minister keep her promise to support the long-term interest of wineries and cideries, especially the smaller businesses like the cideries in my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound, or will she just continue to tax them into bankruptcy? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. With respect to the wine industry, we stand firmly in favour of supporting this industry in terms of its growth in this country, in terms of its growth and economic, and economic development 
and ability to export. The minister's work has taken her into different areas of the world right now. She's traveling to APEC to address the need for diversification in the Asia Pacific. With our agreements and trade accords, what we're doing is ensuring the exportation of Canadian wine and other Canadian industries so that they can meet the important targets that we are setting. Thank you, merci. A member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A free and independent press is vital to democracy, and it is sustained by journalists' remarkable work. From everyday sacrifices to numerous risks, journalists face incredible hardships to inform the world. But Putin's regime has decided to further damage these strong values by closing the CBC Bureau in Moscow to silence journalists from reporting the facts. What is the government's position on this deeply troubling authoritarian decision? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I thank my colleague for this very important question. We strongly condemn this decision by Putin. This is a desperate attempt to cover up the truth and hide his regime's crimes in Ukraine. A free and independent press is essential to report the fact. It's at the core of our democracy, and we should never, never take it for granted. And because around the world, and even here, Journalists are threatened, they are being intimidated. And I sincerely thank Kim journalists and all journalists for the remarkable work and the risk they take every day. Christina Bulkley Valley. Madam Speaker, the situation at Canada's major airports is a mess. Massive lineups, missed flights, stress and anxiety for so many travellers. All this because the government loosened pandemic travel restrictions but didn't do the work necessary to prepare our airports. And what's worse, the brunt of this crisis is falling on airport workers who are working massive overtime, missing breaks and more. How is it, Madam Speaker, that this Minister of Transport has been so woefully unprepared for the return of travel? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as I've said several times uh, throughout the last couple of days, we understand how frustrating it is for Canadians to experience long lines and delays at airports. This is clearly not just a staffing issue alone. CATSA is at 90% of pre-pandemic staffing levels, while travel is at 70% of what it was in 2019. Our government is working really hard with the aviation system and all the agencies involved to make sure that uh, we have a, a plan in place that will reduce these frustrations. Uh, this is a multifaceted issue, and we are working, uh, as I said, with everybody, and we kindly ask all Canadians to remain patient. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And that brings us to the end of question period.